Professor Magoub, you just had an excellent keynote about the new approaches in melanoma. What are efficient methods to find suspect lesions and what should doctors be looking for? So that's a difficult question. What are efficient methods? So right now um, we use our visual uh, exam. Um, we rely on looking for things that are irregular and that's defined by the ABCD criteria, asymmetric, irregular borders, multiple colors, large diameter. It's defined by lesions that look different from others on the patient's skin, so maybe the darkest, the largest, the smallest, the reddest. Um, and also to know the history of a lesion. Has the lesion changed over, the, over time? And this combination of information together with dermoscopy um, is currently the most efficient way of finding uh, an individual lesion uh, differentiating from nevus from melanoma. This, there's a second part of your question, which, which really has to do with what's the most efficient way of screening an individual for cancer, right? So um, there, besides the looking for the irregular and the outlier, it is also to, to compare them to some baseline that they have. Now, obviously, this is not for all patients. So individuals that have a high-risk phenotype with lots of moles, um, if they have a set of baseline images that you can then compare to over the course of time, it allows us the ability to now find very subtle new and changing lesions and then use dermoscopy to help evaluate those. And I think in this combined approach, that is currently the most efficient way of, of finding melanoma. <laughs> Uh, in your talk, you mentioned the human factor. What are the implications of this and uh, how can technology help? I think the implications are huge. Um, hopefully, most clinicians will be aware when they are not having a good day. Now, that can do, be due to a whole host of factors. It may have to do with that maybe they were not feeling well. Maybe they had an argument at home. Maybe there's stress at work. Maybe there's a very large backlog of patients that are waiting to get in, and so there's stress of seeing the patient quickly. Um, but most of the, in my experience, most of the time a physician actually knows that these are issues and will often then either adjust by saying, okay, I don't see anything here, and instead of seeing the patient back in a year, maybe they'll see him back sooner, just to be sure that they didn't miss something. So it's being in tune to yourself. There are other factors that come into play that have to do with visual sciences um, and, and with our ability to what's known as anchoring bias and search satisfaction. What anchoring bias is, is that you anchor the diagnosis on something, ignoring everything else. So for example, you could have a lesion that has an area that looks like a keratosis and you anchor your diagnosis on the keratosis, not realizing that there's another part of the lesion that actually is the melanoma. And then search satisfaction has to do with the fact that you find something, and once you find it, you stop looking for anything else. So you may find a subtle skin cancer and miss the more significant one because you just stopped uh, searching. I think those are factors that just physicians need to be aware of. And, uh, and maybe one way is to, if you find something, keep it on the side, but look at the rest of the skin, then go back, right? Um, but one needs to be aware that there are limitations to, to, to being a human. And um, you also mentioned like um, artificial intelligence that they can now cluster navy and identify the ones that are different. Um, do you think that this will be used more uh, often in the future by I think, so, so computer coming to our aid, I think it's already here and I think it's going to continue to evolve in a very rapid fashion over the next uh, few years. And, and I know for myself, if I can have a computer um, l sort of look at a patient's skin, obviously it's a machine looking, um, and isolate for me the lesions that are new and have changed and spare me the tedious task of doing that, I think that would be a huge benefit. So now I can go in, I already know which ones I have to uh, fixate on and then uh, look at those. 
Um, so that's on one level. On the other level, it is that once you've identified a new or changed lesion, will there be technology that will come to bear in helping to decide when that lesion needs to be biopsied? And I think that that will be true as well. Um, uh, you know, dermoscopy did that to some extent. Um, there is uh, uh, different technologies like um, uh, optical coherence tomography, there's uh, uh, confocal microscopy, there is uh, electrical impedance, there's RNA stripping, which is basically looking at the RNA content in the stratum corneum overlying the lesion. And then in addition to that, there's computer vision. So there are multiple uh, studies that have already looked at, can computers take a isolated lesion and can they be taught to differentiate nevus from melanoma? And that is also proving to be uh, fruitful. So I think it, it will happen. I say most of it is already somewhere happening, uh, but will become more mainstream over the course of the next few years. You also said that I, um, artificial intelligence needs oversight, as uh, one bad physician can hurt a few patients, but a machine can potentially hurt thousands. And how can it be guaranteed that machines are developed in the right way? So I think this has to be, it, it is our responsibility, it's the physician's responsibility. So if we allow technology to just go and we give up, uh, that, that's when that danger can occur. But if we stay in the driver's seat and we take control of this um, and we continuously try and improve the computer, uh, it, is, it would be one way to prevent that from occurring. So we as physicians currently across pretty much the entire earth, um, we are constantly learning. We're constantly improving ourselves going forward. Um, we take courses to improve ourselves. We have to remember that once a computer algorithm is created, right, it needs to continuously evolve. And the only way that will happen is if we take that information and continue to feed it to the computer so that it can improve. But if I take a computer program and stop today, right? It will not learn anything going forward unless we tell it what it is that it's looking at, right? So I think that taking control, keeping uh, uh, technology next to us and the, and the scientists next to us that are uh, doing this, I think is, is one way to avoid that pitfall. And one last question, what would you um, say to physicians or people working in the medical field that are scared of losing their jobs because of uh, the aid of artificial intelligence or computer programs? Well, I don't think physicians will ever lose their job. I think that uh, many may shift in what they do. And I give the example of, uh, so even today, many areas, uh, dermatology and venereal diseases is considered one. But prior to dermatology, there used to be a subspecialty just venereal disease. That subspecialty ended with the discovery of penicillin. But that didn't end us as a profession of being physicians. So I, I think it will, we will morph and we will evolve as the technology uh, comes into play. We will figure out how to use it, how to make it more beneficial to all, us in terms of being more efficient, but probably most important is to deliver the best possible care to the patients that we are uh, uh, dealing with. Professor Magu, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs>